through Mark's gospel. What a great set of praise and worship. Reminding us of something that we all need to be reminded of. Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, looking today at verses 41 to 44. The last time that Jesus steps into the temple. At the end of this chapter, we have this story we know the story as the, the widow who had two mites. Each of them worth an eighth of a penny in our exchange. One four hundredth of a shekel. And the giver of life makes some observations on giving on this occasion. I ask you to stand with me, if you would, as, we, as I read these verses and you follow along in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, please let us know. Please see us. We want you to hold your own Bible, whether you're holding it a hard copy of it, hardbound, leatherbound, softbound, whether it's digital. I want you to be able to look at the Scripture, gaze upon the Scripture yourself. But to be sure that all of us can do that, we'll have the text on the screen for you. Follow along as I read. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Lord, teach us today. This has already been prayed and expressed. Teach us if we are feeling weak, if we feel pressed. Teach us again that you are Jehovah El Shaddai, the God who is all-sufficient. And then teach us your value system. Thank you. Please be seated. Several years ago, the Los Angeles Convention Center was leased in the aftermath of the death of Liberace, to put on display the objects left from his estate. <clears throat> People paid six dollars a piece to go in and view what one person called his grotesque materialism. Following that was an auction at Christie's people paid ten dollars a person to have an opportunity to buy Liberace's belongings. It was all about the money, all about the things. And his life and his death was a testimony to how materialism robs you, robs your soul. In the beginning of his book, Don't Waste Your Life, John Piper tells the story of a couple who worked all of their career lives and they retired and moved to Punta Gorda, Florida, not too terribly far from where my brother pastors. And they spent their time walking along the coast there. If you know anything about the, the Gulf Coast down in that part of Florida, it's famous for its seashell collections that you can find just walking along the beach. And they collected seashells. And Piper says, 
One day, as all of us do, they died. He said, can you imagine them standing before God and saying, look, God, look at my seashells. Piper makes the observation that's a wasted life. The challenge we all face living in the land in which we live is to be caught up in the availability of things. The story after story that runs through my mind, I remember the first time I took my brother Conrad in Bayway to a Walmart. And we could hardly get him out of there. He had a long list of things that folks from Zambia were wanting him to bring back. One of the things was a set of golf sticks. One was a, a wedding band. Walmart actually opened the jewelry counter back up late that night so he could buy a wedding band. But anyway, we went on and on and finally he called his wife. I said, have you talked to your wife? No, we, he called her from the hotel. And it, was, it was two in the morning. And she knew, looking at the time where it was in Zambia, she said, what are you doing up there? And he said, I have been shopping in a store that never closes. Some years later, she came over with him. We took them to get school clothes. And I'll never forget Felicitas looking around and going, shaking her head. Too many choices. Too many choices. Samuel Lamb, whom I got to meet when I was in China, he's since gone to be with the Lord, was in prison for more than 20 years in China for, for his faith, for being a church planter, a pastor, seeing Christianity grow in that communist environment. And I asked him when we finished visiting with him one evening, I said, do you have a word for the church in America? He said, a word for the church in America. He kind of pondered for a moment and he said, uh, the church in China, I thought it was an interesting response to my question, the church in China, he said, we need to pray for the church in China that we not deny the Lord in the face of great persecution. He said, in the church in America, we must pray that the church in America will not deny the Lord in the, great, in the face of great plenty. The church in America must develop a mind set to suffer. A mind, we read about these places where Christians suffer. Have the mind of suffering. He says, that will, that will deliver you from the temptation. All of that comes to bear. We need to recognize that when we read this passage, we read it no matter how, how, how poor we may be by this world, this culture standards, we, we are in this culture the richest people in the earth. Jesus does something very interesting. The passage unfolds, I think, along two, two headings. First, he, Jesus pays attention to our giving. That's, and then Jesus points out God's measure for giving. Let's just look at this for a few minutes together. He pays attention to our giving. He is just publicly scolded and embarrassed the scribes. talks about how they love to strut in public. Long robes. Long prayers. He says, but they devour widows' houses. And he exposes them. And it's with that background that he goes into the temple for the last time. He sits down opposite the treasury. Well, this, this treasury, by the way, I need to give you a description of it. In the temple, there was a, there was a place, and there were 13 uh, receptacles. Now, they were designed with a small opening at the top, and then it expanded to the bottom. So they would look like trumpets sitting on the, on the outgoing end of the trumpet. And there were 13 of them, and they referred to them as the 13 trumpets. So you would drop your coin in the top and as it was enlarged at the bottom it would go to fill the coffers. And there were inscriptions on them. One was for new shekel dues. One was for old shekel dues. One was for bird offerings. One was for young birds for the whole offering. One was for wood. Frankincense. Gold for the mercy seat. And then on six of them, there was this identification as free will offerings. Now, Passover is taking place. A myriad of people 
was gathered in Jerusalem. Those who lived there had their regular pattern of giving. Those who, who journeyed, who made pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover would have the, have the opportunity to give into the, the trumpets, the treasury, these chests. And they would pass by and put them in. And you can see, you, you, you have a, just use your imagination of what that looked like. It's very public. It can be very ostentatious. You can imagine those who had great wealth, some would come and not even able to carry by themselves the weight of shekels that they were going to contribute to the treasury. Jesus sits down in a place where he's, the emphasis is not on him, but he's watching. It's sort of like if you, when you go to the airport, if you're waiting on your plane, you don't know if you do this, just sit and watch the people go by. You can sometimes reading, sometimes uh, just watching people. And he's watching. We discover as he teaches his disciples that he wasn't just watching their actions. He was watching their motives. I would remind you that in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches, repeatedly Jesus says, speaking through the messenger to each church, I know, I know your deeds. And I, when we went through Revelation together, I taught you then that 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 statement by Jesus can either encourage us because sometimes you may feel like you're overlooked, you may feel like no one notices. What good is it for me to serve? What good is it for me to give? What good is it for me to pray? Jesus says, I know. No one else may know, but I know. But also it can have a bone chilling effect. I know. And he said it indeed to encourage some of those churches and he said it as a rebuke to the, the other churches. We have this knowing, this all-knowing, all-seeing Christ who's sitting opposite the treasury watching. Hannah said it this way in 1 Samuel 2, 3. The Lord is a God of knowledge. He knows. And by Him actions are weighed. We really can't. We, we can't weigh one another's actions Perfectly, I mean, by the, there's, there's patterns that develop and you kind of have an idea, you know. But Jesus starts with perfect knowledge and that knowledge is used to weigh our actions. So I think it's important for you to understand that Jesus pays attention to our giving. Just like he pays attention to everything in our lives. The watching Savior. And here's what he saw. Many rich people put in large sums. Now that's not bad. This is not a teaching of our Lord that being rich is evil or giving large sums of the treasury is uh, superficial. That's not the point at all. In fact, you see when you read in the book of Acts that there's this fellow named Barnabas who was a great source of encouragement to the church. In fact, they called him the son of encouragement. And he set the example for the early churches. He, he liquidated a portion of his, of his material wealth in terms of real estate and he, he came and brought that sum and laid it at the feet of the apostles that the church might be ministered to and blessed because, you see, Barnabas and others were living in the aftermath of the tremendous outbreak of the gospel that took place at Pentecost 50 days after this, what we're studying here, Passover. But he observes that. And we have to be careful. We have to be sure that, that, that we give from a heart. Paul says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I've taught you before that that, that word in, the, in that letter to the Corinthian church is the word hilarion. The Lord loves a hilarious giver. He, 
delights to give. In fact, Paul taught, Paul taught the Corinthians that there, there are some of you there who want to give, but you don't have the means to. But he said, it's your, it's your wanting heart, it's your willing heart, it's your desire. God looks upon the desire and recognizes that. One of the commentaries I was reading told about a man when the church held a meeting and they were taking subscriptions for donations and he stood up and said, I want to give $100 anonymously. That's what troubles the Lord. Ostentation. So that, that, was, the, that was the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. That was, it was all about show for them. So here they are. They've gathered from all over the known world to travel for Passover. He not only observed that many wealthy people put in much wealth. That wasn't his only observation. We also told a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And of course, the, the use of the word penny there uh, is a little different. When you, when you run the value of it, Today, as I said earlier, these these mites or farthings, whatever you want to call them, they were they were in fact they were the word for it means thin. It's the word lepta. It it means fine or, or peeled. It was a very thin coin. So much so that one writer observed or suggested that when she dropped hers into the trumpets, that it probably didn't even make a sound. Certainly not like a shekel. Jesus saw that too. So he knows. He knows our giving habits. He knows mine. He knows yours. He knows the heart with which we He knows whether we give begrudgingly or whether we give joyfully. He knows whether we give the first fruits or whether we give from what's left over. He knows all of that. It's a good challenge to us to ask ourselves not what does anybody else know, but what does Jesus know? What is, what's his evaluation of the matter? And so it's with this, this contrast here. Many, many people, many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow. There's the contrast. Jesus is going to be teaching now. The widows, of course, were women with great challenges in Jesus' day, just as many are today still. Without a man to support her, she either had to beg or depend on family to take care of her. And if she was a young widow, there were other temptations that arose. Jesus points out her circumstances. A poor widow. A poor woman would have been one thing. A poor widow. No man at home to sustain her, to care for her. These, this little amount she put in is a day's wages for someone like her. She was living out the Shema, which we talked about a couple of Sundays ago. What's the greatest commandment? The first, to love the Lord your God with all of your being, all that you have. She's fleshing that out. She's saying, I love you. She could have put in one. And that would have been an incredible sacrifice for her. She put in two. Years ago, when my mother and father were visiting us in a church I was pastoring, one of our children had just had a birthday and had gotten money for the birthday. And mom was sitting next to this child the next day in church. And the offering was passed and the child reached in and took out the money, the, the birthday money, and put it in the plate. And my mother, I, I, don't, don't put it all in. And it cut her to the heart. 
she told me about it later. She said, Bill, she said, I felt awful. She said, I was, I was actually hindering his giving heart. She just didn't know any better. Her devotion to God spilled over in her giving. God asked through the prophet Malachi, Will a man rob God? And the people respond, Where, How have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? He said. Jesus observes the rich putting in much. But he remarks on the widow's gift. And put yourself as one of the people observing. We would have been so impressed in all likelihood with the great gifts given. And then almost yawned at what this woman did. Not so our Savior. Look at the second thing here. Jesus points out God's measure for giving, how God measures giving. Verses 43 and 44, he, he called the disciples to him. He said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Folks, that is not possible if God uses a calculator to measure giving. It's not possible. The math doesn't add up. But he teaches God's measure. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live on. Now, this is not about, you know, I need to say this because there are plenty of charlatans on TV and under big tents and in convention centers who take this passage and use it to manipulate people to, to be foolish and give to their ministries and put themselves in a bind. That's not what this is about. And when, when it's used for that, it is, it is being abused and is taking God's name in vain to suggest that that's what this passage teaches. But it is teaching something. It is teaching something. It is teaching us that God looks on the heart and how the heart works itself out in the life. We can't see into one another's hearts. But we don't have to. God does. Think about what it's teaching us here. First, when it comes to giving, the attitude of the heart makes all the difference. You see, if I gave a million dollars, but I gave it begrudgingly, there's no value to it. Oh, it's a lot of money. Make no mistake. That kind of money doesn't spend well for kingdom causes. In fact, it tends to dry up. When it comes to giving, the attitude of our hearts before God is what makes all the difference. You write a mortgage check every month, many of you. Or a rent check. That, that company doesn't care about your attitude. It just wants the money. But God does. The attitude is everything with Him. He loves hilarious givers. He loves givers with the attitude of David when they were collecting money to build the temple. And David said, who are we? God, who are we that we would get to get on, on something like this? He knows. Second thing I want us to see is that God can do great things with tiny offerings. We, we saw the same thing, by the way, when you study the, the story of the little lad who had the lunch when thousands were on the hillside. The disciples said, the people are hungry. Send them home, Lord. They don't have anything to eat. We can't feed them. And one of the disciples finds a, little, a willing boy. And you, you say, well, his, there was a miracle. He took the loaves and the fish and Jesus blessed them and multiplied them and fed everybody there and had 12 baskets of remains left so that the disciples could literally and figuratively chew on what had just happened. 
And that story has been told over and over and over. And it is a reminder to us that whatever little you may have when devoted to God is always more than enough. The catch is devoted to God. And this, little, this woman's small gift, unnoticed by most, has set the standard for centuries. God can do great things with your little bit. I told you earlier that about an eighth of a cent each, these two pennies we would call them, about an eighth of a cent. A shekel, one shekel, 400 times greater. Think of the bags of shekels that were being brought to the treasury. God loves to make much out of little. And the devil loves to lie to us and say, well, you don't have enough to give that God might make. So wait until you do. The devil always wants us to wait for a more convenient season. Faith says act now. Now is all you have. If there's love and sacrifice with the giver in the giving, there's spiritual power in the gift. That's what Jesus is teaching here. So what the church needs is not more money, but larger hearts devoted to Him. Jesus uses this story as He teaches His disciples and as we, we are learning from it, 2,000 years later, he teaches us to recognize that it's, it's not about how much. We've said this in so many different ways through the years. It's not equal giving. It's equal loving. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. To love your neighbor as yourself. When loving God and loving others increases. Hear me now. Not necessarily the amount in the offering increases, though I think that does happen sometimes. When loving God and loving others increases, then God's usefulness enlarges. The thing I want you to see is All things will be set straight at the judgment. Look, God, look at our seashell collection. But Lord, we, we did mighty things in your name. We prophesied in your name. We engaged in spiritual warfare in your name. beggar dies and is ushered by the angels into the bosom of Abraham. Paradise. And the rich man who fared sumptuously and lacked for nothing died. He lifts up his eyes and looks into paradise and sees there the beggar who had lived outside his gates and says, Oh, Father Abraham, sinned Send this man. Send Lazarus with just a little water on the tip of his tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. You see, it's all made right at the judgment. The last will be first. Those who imagine themselves first will be last. In Jesus' case, as he's teaching here, again, make no doubt about it. There are Pharisees. There are Sadducees. There are scribes. There are members of the Sanhedrin around this place. But at the judgment, this woman who was probably overlooked, if not despised, 
Religious leaders probably saw her as, as high maintenance. We've got to, got to take care of her. That's what we're supposed to do. No, she won't get a crown. Finally, but Jesus teaches us that it's, that it's not about, that there's, God is not a respecter of persons when it comes to this. See, the Jews, I've talked to this before, the Jews thought that a person with great wealth was someone highly favored of God. He was blessed of God. That's why he had what he had. And the person that didn't have anything or had very little was despised by God. God hadn't blessed him or her for whatever reason, but it didn't matter what the reason was. The evidence was plain in the, in the, in the way that these people viewed reality. You know, the ground is level at the cross, brothers and sisters. The worst person who lived the most profligate life and comes to the end of his or her life and cries out for mercy is as saved as the person who in early childhood came to faith in Christ and lived a life of devotion to Him all the days of her life. Because it's all of mercy. That's the point. It's not how much you have or don't have. That's the devil's lie. Jesus said, I've come to give life. Full life. Meaningful life. Blessed life. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the religious leaders that Jesus has been encountering are having their very souls stolen by the enemy because they look at the wrong things. God looks on the heart. We look on the outward appearance and we need to say, oh dear God, help me, first of all, in my own life, to value what you value. Paul said this about the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. It's, said them to the Corinthians about the churches in Macedonia. Listen to this. But I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. So he's, he's if you remember the context of this, he's exhorting them and encouraging them to be ready with the collection when he comes so he could take the money back to Jerusalem and help that struggling church that struggled all of its life during the, the New Testament period. He says, listen to the churches in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Folks, that, that, that is completely nonsensical except in the context of the grace of God. Listen to this again. They were experiencing a severe test of affliction. And they responded to it spiritually and physically. Materially, if you say, if you please. Their abundance of joy. That's where it starts. You see, people, too often, I'm guilty of this, and I repent when I say this to myself, too often we tie our joy to our circumstances. And it's impossible for them to have had joy given the fact that they were, that they were parentheses by a, test of, a severe test of affliction and extreme poverty. That, those two little parentheses there in, in, too often in our lives means it's impossible that what's in, in the middle of that is abundant joy. Unless. Unless all that thrills my soul is Jesus. Unless we're strangers and pilgrims moving through this world looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, a house not made with human hands in the heavens unless we remember that Jesus said I'm going to prepare a place for you and as surely as I go and prepare a place for you I will come again receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also you see if that is the perspective and that was the perspective of the Macedonian churches a severe test of affliction their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part and he's not talking there about a record offering He's talking about a heart attitude overflowed 
a wealth of generosity. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. Sounds like this poor widow, doesn't it? Of their own accord. It was, it was free. Not coerced. Not manipulated. This is the last thing I ever want to do in this place is teach on giving, preach on giving, speak on stewardship, and somebody have a guilt trip. If you're under a guilt trip, get rid of that now. That's from the devil. That's not from the Word of God. But examine. They begged us earnestly. Verse 4. Sound like David. For the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And that is the key. You see, if when we take up an offering or when we, when we have opportunities for, for mission and ministry, if you don't first of all see yourself in the offering plate, <laughs> if that's not there first, then it doesn't matter what follows. God does not want our money. He wants us. And in giving us, then He has all we, we have. One, one writer, I thought this was clever. I just want to read this. This was a commentator. He said, there's a disease which is particularly virulent in, the part, in this part of the 20th century. So he wrote several years ago. It is called cirrhosis of the giver. It was actually discovered about 34 A.D., and ran a terminal course in a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. You remember them? Barnabas had sold a parcel of land. He took the proceeds he got from the land and laid it down at the apostles' feet and said, I hope this, I hope this helps. Praying God will bless this. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira saw the, they saw the notoriety, the publicity that Barnabas got, though he wasn't seeking it. And so they went and sold some land and they gave a portion of what they made from the land in the same way. And apparently led the apostles to believe we did just like Barnabas. We sold this land. Here's what we got for it. Here it is. Well, Peter says you lied to the Holy Spirit. So the episode, of course, was that, that, that they asked the husband to come in. And interesting. Now, this, think about this. What, what the early church must have been like. They asked him, is this really what you got from the sale of the land? They weren't, it wasn't like, we really... Appreciate your gift. The, the, the amount of the gift was subsidiary. Is this really what you got from the sale of the land? Well, it sure is. Died right there. Carried him out. Well, the wife comes in. I need to ask you. Is this what you got from the sale of the land? Sure. Died right there. Great fear came upon the church and those around them. There were some that said, I don't know if we want to join that church. Uh, people die mysteriously in that church. So he goes on and says, a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. It is an acute condition which renders the patient's hand immobile when it attempts to move from the billfold to the offering plate. The remedy is to remove the afflicted from the house of God since it is clinically observable that this condition disappears in alternate environments such as restaurants, movie theaters, etc. Et he says this. Actually, the disease is really not a motor problem but a heart problem. And the best remedy is to fall in love with God with all your heart. For, as Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is your heart is there also. You see, where your heart is, your treasure. And I'm still haunted hearing my Greek professor one day we were studying through one of the letters in the New Testament. Said, he said two things. He said, hand me your checkbook. I'll tell you who your God is. And the second thing he said was, I don't think God's so concerned about the amount you put in the offering plate as he is what you do with the amount you keep. Those things rocked me. People, this is a time when a lot of you are struggling, and I know that. Don't let the devil lie to you. 
There's no such thing as being too poor to give. And when, when, when you buy into that lie, you rob yourself of the joy. Jesus said, this woman, this woman set the example. Not because she gave everything she had, but because she gave sacrificially. She gave joyfully. She gave hopefully. The little we have given to God is always something He will do more with than we can do with it ourselves, number one. And then He will do, and here's the measure, because Jesus said it finally, they gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her need. How do you give? How do I give? I have to, how do I give? May the Lord help us to realize that we are in this together. We, we face challenges. We had a great discussion last Sunday night. If you weren't here, I'm sorry you missed the good input, questions, observations. It was very healthy. But the bottom line to it was the needs of our building and our facility and what we do with it go to the heart. It is a heart matter. If somebody dropped a sack of money in the middle of us so that we turn this place into a, 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 one of the greatest cathedrals on the planet for the worship of God, it still would not address the deepest need. The need of the heart. Am I willing to be sacrificial when I give? Am I willing to be sacrificial as I go? Am I willing to, am I willing to deny myself and reach out and touch others? Am I willing to put myself in the uncomfortable position of saying, come and go with me? You see, it's, it's the heart. And that's what Jesus pointed out in this passage. He loved this woman's heart because her heart was set on God. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Your heart and your treasure go hand in hand. They follow one another. They're twins. You don't see them separate. Where's your heart today? I have to answer that. You have to answer that. God knows the answer already. And so if we find that our heart is not where it ought to be, we say, Lord, I repent. I give my heart to you anew and afresh. Or for some here, I give my heart to you for the first time. Lord, Take my life and let it be consecrated unto Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my hands, let them move at the impulse of Your love. Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated because here's the bottom line if he has that brothers and sisters he has everything let's pray dear heavenly father we thank you for the lord jesus christ who who showed us who would who would in not not many days after this episode recorded in mark would show us what it means to pay it all he paid it all all to him we owe our sin left a crimson stain. Jesus, in giving Himself, washed it white as snow. We thank You for a Savior who lived perfectly, who died tragically, bearing our sin and enduring Your wrath for sin, rising from the grave three days later and saying, by grace through faith in Me, You can be empowered to live a life consecrated unto Jesus. May you find that in my life. May you find that in the lives of the brothers and sisters here. And Lord, in those who are not yet followers of Christ, I pray that their lives would be given over to you, repenting and believing and that you would take that life and make it your own. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's